we'll call it quits for now. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time. So it was about four years ago that we last looked at this book in a video called The Macroscopic Universe. And uh, I have since purchased it because this book is so awesome. But uh, we are focused tonight on the quantum realm of the microscopic universe. And they even have the margins here of the entire introduction are particles. The trails of particles that arise in the particle, the gas chambers in particle accelerators when they collide protons and other particles together. And these are the generations of products of those collisions. And we're going to find out tonight the fact that the universe is so grand and massive I think sometimes allows us to forget that as gargantuan as the entire universe and all the galactic structures and then the galaxies and then the stars and the solar systems and even the planets are all of that is made up of much smaller building blocks at the tiniest scale the universe's matter is composed of fundamental particles some of which governed by various forces group together to form atoms and when atoms gain or lose electrons then they're called charged particles or ions now when they gain or lose neutrons one of the nucleons in the center that form the nucleus of an atom those are called isotopes it's the proton the positively charged nucleon in the center of the atom that defines what type of element that the atom is. You can have different isotopes of the same element like gold and if it loses or gains a neutron if the neutron degenerates into other particles then the gold is still going to have the same number of protons so it's still going to be gold it's only when the proton decays in some shape or form or the atom fuses or breaks apart the nucleus of it through fission then that becomes two products that have different numbers of protons and those are different elements so you have isotopes which are, which are varying numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. Then you have ions, which are varying numbers of electrons in the outer shells surrounding the nucleus. And um, the element itself can be take various forms of ions or isotopes of any particular element now to me it's again looking at real pictures of what we're talking about here because it's easy to see this and I don't know get too lost in the abstraction of it this is an image of gold atoms on a grid of green carbon atoms made by a scanning tunneling electron microscope and that's just 
incredible to think about that's an actual it's digitally filtered but nonetheless that data is the actual boundaries of the electron clouds around the atom itself you know I want to look that up actually I want to see what a scanning tunneling microscope actually is so a scanning tunneling microscope is a type of microscope used for imaging surfaces at the atomic level its development in 1981 earned the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1986 so it uses a okay and I uh, I just called it an electron microscope and it says, I just caught that up there, not to be s confused with a scanning electron Michael's microscope. Which produces images of a sample by scanning the surface with a focused beam of electrons that interact with atoms in the sample. Providing information about the surface topography. So, a scanning tunneling microscope uses an extremely sharp conducting tip that can distinguish features smaller than a tenth of a nanometer with a hundredth of a nanometer depth resolution. This means that the individual atoms can routinely be imaged and manipulated conducting tip most of them are built for use in ultra high vacuum at temperatures approaching absolute zero zero which makes sense because so the atoms aren't oscillating vibrating a lot with heat but variants exist for studies in air water and other environments and for temperatures over a thousand centigrade. Wow. So they're based on the concept of quantum tunneling. Which specifically is... Objects like electrons or atoms pass through a potential barrier according to classical mechanics. That the en object shouldn't have sufficient energy to surmount. That's so amazing. So here's a video showing the tunneling effect. Quantum tunnel effect and its application to the scanning tunneling microscope. When a quantum object is sent on a thick barrier, it bounces off. If the barrier is thin enough, the object may sometimes get through, or tunnel through. The thinner the barrier, the more likely the object is to pass. And there's the conducting tip. A metal is made up of quantum atoms and electrons. If we approach a very thin tip electrically powered, it may tear the electrons tear the electrons from the metal by tunnel effect. By measuring the electric current through the tip, we can reconstruct where the atoms are. This is the principle of the scanning, scanning tunneling microscope then. Okay. Wow. Just think of the precision for that tip to be able to get, well, to be able to be that small to begin with, but then to be able to get that close to the atoms. That is unreal. That is so incredible that it gets that close to atoms. Just imagine the, the precision 
that it would have to the machines would have to have incremental movements to be able to get that close to the the layer that it's trying to probe good lord And then now we're off on the Wikipedia rabbit hole. <laughs> Quantum tunneling plays an essential role in the physical phenomena like nuclear fusion, alpha radioactive decay of atomic nuclei. So that would be the atomic number. So an alpha particle is a helium nucleus. Two protons, two neutrons. And atomic nuclei are always spontaneously decaying in a probabilistic but not a directly predictable manner so you can kind of that's where the concept of half-life comes into play is that you understand that any given sample of a particular element each element has its own half-life will decay half of that sample will decay in a given period of time but you don't know which atoms are going to decay and you don't know how how uh, well you don't know how the sample will evolve as it uh, goes it's just over general periods of time you have the idea that there's a high probability of half of those atoms decaying by the measured half-life so uranium-238 decays to thor thorium-234 man so it decays and loses the atomic mass number is the total number of nucleons it loses which is four two protons two neutrons but the atomic number is the number of protons again that defines the actual element of the atom and alpha decay is so I believe it's a, a result of the weak nuclear force or the weak interaction oh no it's the strong nuclear force okay and the electromagnet so it's an interplay so beta decay is where an atomic nucleus emits a beta particle transforming into an isobar of that nuclide decay of a neutron transforms it into a proton by the emission of an electron accompanied by an anti-neutrino so beta decay is when the up quarks and down quarks that compose and that make up protons and neutrons it's when the weak force allows a quark to change its flavor by emission of a W boson leading to the creation of an electron antineutrino or a positron neutrino pair neutrino for example a neutron composed of two down quarks and an up quark decays to a proton composed of a down quark and two up quarks so here we have intermediate W boson has been omitted for simplicity protons 
there's a neutron decaying into a proton and that positive charge is offset by the electron and the neutrino the uh, anti-neutrino interesting so so <laughs> we got off on that tangent talking about scanning tunneling microscopes and they're different than electron tunneling microscopes it's so fascinating that the energy you know governing that these f physical when you get down to the quantum realm things become more energetic it becomes a more matter of probabilities and energies than it does physical concepts and characteristics like speed and uh, location and size it just becomes a matter of how a cloud an electron cloud is distributed it becomes a matter of what energy level what binding energy the electrons around a nucleus have and uh, it's just so amazing that uh, the forces and the rules that govern those the use of those forces in the universe are what they are and now electrons can be bound to a location roughly it's so interesting that it's roughly local to the nucleus so we can see a layer of gold in the concept of binding energy is really interesting too um, but I don't want to get too scatterbrained here Binding energy, yeah, there's multiple types of binding energies, from the quantum to the nuclear to the atomic, the electron around the atomic, then the bond energy between atoms, and uh, the valence electrons at the furthest position or orientation configuration around the atom together and then there's gravitational at the furthest levels of uh, furthest distances in the universe binding energy is the smallest amount of energy required to remove a particle from a system of particles or to dissemble disassemble a system of particles into individual parts so it's the minimal energy you have to either inject into a system and to disassemble the system. So it could be gravitational where you perturb it with a minimal amount of energy to be able to blow the gravitational potential apart to the point where they are no longer bound and they, they've reached escape velocity from the central gravitational force attracting them all or on the microscopic scale that we're focused on today you have the bond energy the minimal amount of energy and it gets increasingly at the molecular level down through the atomic nuclear and then fundamental elementary particle level it gets increasingly larger so you have, if a body, like going through gravitational all the way to quantum chromodynamic binding energy here, if a body, the gravitational section here says, if a body with the mass and radius of Earth were made purely of hydrogen, 
then the gravitational binding energy of that body would be about 0.39 electron volts per atom. And if a hydrogen body had the mass and radius, radius of the sun, its gravitational binding energy would be about 1,200 electron volts per atom. And so that's how much energy it would take to rip those to, to break the force, uh, gravitational, purely gravitational force, due to a mass of hydrogen atoms, the size, the mass, the volume of the sun, 1,200 electron volts. Now, if you move down and you think about the actual, the bonds between the electrons, the molecular bonds holding two individual carbon atoms or hydrogen atoms together um, so now you're in the gravitational example we were ignoring the all the other binding energies the molecular bonds the atomic nuclear elementary particle bonds now we're ignoring the quantum or the, the gravitational bonds between them so if you ignore that weak gravitational attraction between to carbon atoms, for instance. The bond disassociation energy here is 3.6 electron volts. And so bond disassociation energy bond energy and bond and how to disassemble or break that bond bond disassociation energy or measures of the binding energy between atoms chemically it's the energy required to break them apart such as in chemical explosions or reactions the burning of chemical fuel or biological processes Bond energies are typically in the range of a few electron volts per bond. And uh, so while 3.6 electron volts are less, much less than, you know, um, 1,000, 1,200 electron volts per atom, if uh, the gravitational binding energy to break it apart and have those particles expand, accelerate, or, or move apart from each other into infinity without being gravitationally attracted back, falling back towards each other, um, it, we see it's only 0.39 electron volts per atom when it's the size of the Earth. And you can imagine how small that binding energy or the uh, gravitational bind dissolution energy would be as you get smaller and smaller clumps of matter. And so we go down here now from the molecular level of 3.6 electron volts. And by the way, that's what causes a sunburn from UV radiation. 3.6 volts, electron volts, is right around the energy of UV radiation. Um, as you go from infrared, which is weaker and longer wavelengths, to increasingly higher energy wavelengths of visible light, from red all the way through the visible spectrum to blue, and then beyond blue and violet, you get ultraviolet, UV, and it's at that point that the energy in the waves or photons becomes high enough, the wavelengths become short enough, each individual photon at the ultraviolet level has enough energy to actually break the covalent bonds in our of the atoms in our skin and so as you increase beyond ultraviolet you go to soft and then hard x-rays and then gamma rays 
those are called ionizing radiation because they split, they rip the electrons off of the atoms in our skin, making them ions. And so uh, anything below UV radiation or visible light, um, visible light in longer wavelengths, visible light, infrared, microwaves, radio waves, those are all non-ionizing radiation because any individual photon from regions of the electromagnetic spectrum at the visible wavelengths or longer are uh, do not have enough energy in them to burn us, to ionize the electrons off our atoms, to ionize the atoms in our skin. And now the binding energy we can see increases as we move down the scale in size. So from atom to atom at the atom to atom at the molecular level, 3.6 electron volts roughly around that range. And then the atomic level, we start to get into see the uh, what does it say the outermost electron in an atom of cesium to the innermost electron of an atom of copper. It's eleven point five thousand electron volts. The electron binding energy more common commonly known as the ionization energy. So so the bond energy there at the molecular level was explosions. That's ripping two atoms apart but not necessarily ionizing them. And so to correct, kind of clarify that, um, I had that wrong. Three point, it's more like 3.9 electron volts is the ionization energy, but you know, roughly the same order of magnitude there. Um, Yeah, once you hit UV light, you're hitting close to 4 electron volts, and that's the energy required to free an electron from its atomic orbital. And then the binding energy, if you were to take... So the ionization energy is the outermost electron. But if we were to take the summation of all the electrons of any given atom, which, as you increase the atomic nucleus... That positive charge, you're increasing the number of protons, that is the larger nucleus that increases and changes the chemical, the actual element of the atom. Um, as you get larger and larger elements with larger mass numbers, larger nuclei, larger numbers of protons, and of course nu neutrons um, in varying amounts, different isotopes that go along with that, you are also increasing the central positive charge of the atom there. And to have a relatively balanced uh, atoms do generally tend, tend to want to be neutral electrically. So you'll have an, a fairly proportionate amount of electrons balancing the negative with the positive uh, charge of the nucleus there and so if you sum up the energy it would take to rip the bind the bonds of the all the electrons which can be a lot if you have an atom with you know dozens of electrons around it that is the atomic binding energy so the ionization energy, the electron binding energy is just the outermost valence electrons, which are typically the weakest, the least firmly bound. Of course, you know, that's the first to get ripped off a from the um, shell of an atom because they are the furthest away from the center the nucleus. There you have the weakest binding energy. They're the most easily stripped off 
from that atom. As you get closer and closer, the orbitals that are closer and closer to the nucleus, those add electrons in those orbitals, take more, higher, more and more energy, higher and higher levels of electron volts um, to be stripped clean from their atoms. At which point you would have a completely disassembled atom disassembled, dissolved into free electrons and free nuclei. So you would have protons and neutrons just entirely moving independent of their electrons, which is what we had at the beginning of the universe. There was a phase after which matter had congealed out of the forces into matter, into protons, and the quarks had bound up and um, emerged out of the super force and the grand unified force after those broke into the strong, the electroweak, and then the electroweak force broke into its the individual weak force and electromagnetic force. The quarks eventually, uh, in, in trillions, trillions of a second here, emerged out of this soup of energy bound together in triplets in different flavors, configurations, created protons, neutrons, but the universe before the soup that is uh, denoted by the cosmic microwave background, the universe was still so hot that the electrons were moving, had too much energy, way beyond the binding energy, um, to have a tendency to stably bind and attach themselves to the nucleons, the, uh, the freely floating protons and neutrons, to form the first atoms. So it took a while before they were formed, and, um, and as we go further and further down now to beyond the electron binding energy, the atomic, the nuclear binding energy of the nucleus of the atom is even more powerful going well beyond the electron volts and thousands of electron volts of the atomic binding energy. We're in the realm of the nucleus in which we have to talk about the energy required to disassemble the nucleus into free unbound neutrons and protons. And this is, this is where we're talking about the strong force and the energy liberated in atomic fission bombs and uh, it's the energy equivalent of the mass defect the difference between the mass number of a nucleus and its measured mass nuclear binding energy derives from the nuclear force or the residual strong force which is mediated by three types of mesons so the average nuclear binding energy per nucleon, neutron or proton, ranges from 2.2 million electron volts for hydrogen to 8.79 million for nickel, the isotope of nickel, nickel 62. And then finally, once you get down to breaking up the nucleons themselves into the quarks that compose them, the nucleons of protons and neutrons are composed of quarks that themselves are bound, mediated by gluons, also by the uh, gluons connecting them, holding them into a bound state through the strong force or the strong interaction. And this is not just single digit millions but hundreds of millions, almost a billion electron volts that you would need to inject into a system of particles to uh, rip the quarks apart. Quantum chromodynamics binding energy is, the, is misusing 
the dom denomination of a lack of energy. It addresses the mass and kinetic energy of the parts that bind the various quarks together inside a had hadron. A hadron being a composite subatomic particle made of two or more quarks held together by the strong energy. Chromodynamic binding energy in a nucleon amounts to 99% of the nucleon's mass. So at the level of the quark, at the level of the nucleon, that triplet, quark triplets com comprise, 99% of the measured mass of a proton or a neutron is pure energy. Pure energy. Of the quarks being bound together and I wouldn't even know what a quark would mean at that level if it's a you can't even talk about again locations positions really size beyond approximations when you're talking about the heaviness the matter of an object you know we're touching this this book the way we feel things layered deep inside the, the the molecular bonds the electrons that create those bonds and then the electrons surrounding the individual atoms that make up the molecules then those electrons stripped off leave just a bare nucleus made up of nucleons, then we go down into the nucleons, the neutrons and po protons themselves are bound together. And then we talk about the proton individually and what comprises that as quarks made of almost pure energy. 99% of a nucleon's mass is energy. The chromodynamic binding energy of a proton is about 928.9 million electron volts, while that of a neutron, slightly less massive, is 927.7 million electron volts. Large binding energy between bottom quarks, 280 mi million or mega electron volts causes some theoretically expected reactions with lambda baryons to release 138 million electron volts per event. The missing mass may be lost during the process of binding as energy in the form of heat or light with the removed energy corresponding to the removed mass through Einstein's equation. Which is so, so, so fascinating that you can actually measure the redu reduction of mass of any system all the way from gravitational systems of stars to molecular bonds and then the electron binding energies around the atoms and then you know the nuclear unbinding and fissioning of nucleons and fission bombs to theoretical uh, unraveling or not theoretical because this is what they do in the particle accelerators of protons into their constituent particles. The loss of mass can be accounted for by Einstein's equation. The energy is equal exactly to that mass times the speed of light squared. 
And that's one of the greatest mysteries in physics is why the universe has these baked in values. Speed of light being one of the one of the most dominant values ever. So uh <laughs> anyways a scanning tunneling microscope <laughs> back to our crawling back out of out of our rabbit hole here <laughs> is uh it uses quantum tunneling which is the tendency now that we understand all the binding energies here for electrons around the nucleus of an atom to sometimes creep beyond the known binding energy binding them into their their orientations their uh, electron orbitals around the nucleus they sometimes the probability wave distributions of where the electron should be measured sometimes goes extends uh, beyond and two atoms in close enough proximity are going to sometimes interact with each other in a way that this microscope uh, consistently enough is able to detect as oscillations as disruptions in a continuous signal which like all digital equipment from your phone microphone monitors anything you think about that it's electronic is simply distortions of a constant signal and then those distortions those patterns of distortions are decoded and transmitted into whatever it is that you're trying to uh, harness whether it's an image a matrix of images um, audio or even um, a uh, gravitational wave detected from a satellite orbiting a million miles away a scanning tunneling microscope here wow so maybe that's the tip right there get larger oh yeah look at that hmm huh. that looks really uh really crude huh it's really cool but not as uh clean and polished as I would have expected a large scanning tunneling microscopes at the London Center for Nanotechnology that looks more, more like it. And some uh, Dewar to cool it down to near zero. Wow. So there's a, the tip right there, a vacuum in the sample. The energy tunnels across the vacuum so there's no air no other atoms to be the intermediate transmitter of energy or signals and uh, wow that's amazing so one atom thick silver islands grown on terraces of the surface of palladium Two hundred and fifty nanometers across. And then here, this is uh, one point four nanometers wide. This is a ten by ten nanometer image. 
each individual gold atom is 1.4 nanometers wide. surface of a crystal of silicon carbide are arranged in the hexa hexagonal lattice part of a third of a nanometer apart look at how that's amazing it's incredible how the you know I know they're only superficially related but how that fuzziness it's like the uh black hole image of M87 just reminds me of just the spectrum of the boundaries of our technology at the moment we're able to see the hazy outlines of individual atoms and then the hazy outline of an accretion disk of a multi-million or billion solar mass black hole millions of light years away. That's incredible. Well, let me, let's make sure I got it right here. It's in the Virgo cluster distance. Yeah, 50 million light years away. Well, going back to our book, now that we've read like a single sentence out of it, um, now we have an idea of what matter is. And of course, we, as much as we know about the ordinary matter on Earth and so much that we can detect from the cosmos raining in through its emission of light, the photon, the momentum, the energy carrier between atoms. Which, by the way, it's interesting to think about if a photon is the ultimate speed limit of the universe, and Einstein's relativity indicates that the faster you go, the smaller duration of time will elapse for you between any distance in the cosmos billions of light years will seem like an instant the closer you are to going the speed of light than a photon that is light itself therefore traveling at the speed of light unless it's in some medium but if it's in a vacuum of space will to the extent that it has consciousness, perceive no duration between the Big Bang, its emission from that soup of hot atoms, nucleons and electrons that would emit those photons, this massive, bright, a hundred million, you know, maybe billion, billions of light years wide, you know, boiling soup that look, would look like a single star, a single furnace at the beginning of the universe. That photon, those photons traveling and hitting our detectors who's measuring the now shifted visible photons or ultraviolet photons that have shifted all the way down to a lower energy of in the microwave region now. Those photons wouldn't have noticed any elapse in time. 
zero time from the Big Bang until it hit our detectors, which for us, at the rate we measure time at least, would be about almost 14 billion light years, billion years in, uh, in time. So it's interesting to think about how light, things moving at the speed of light, maybe future civilizations able to harness light speed or faster than light travel won't even have the barrier of a duration of a trip that takes time to go from one star to the next, one galaxy to the next. So we have atoms and ions being the ordinary kinds of matter. We have photons that come in and they transmit energy. In this simple model here of an electron orbiting a nucleus, negative electron orbiting a positive nucleus, we have the absorption of the photon at, point, at, at which point the photon becomes annihilated. It just no longer exists. It gets absorbed in the most literal sense, I guess, by the electron. The electron absorbs its energy, which increases its valence. It goes into an outer shell that is at a higher energy level that takes energy to arrive at, at which point, uh, after some time, the electron if there's a vacancy there, has a tendency to want to drop back down. And there's a spontaneous emission of a photon of that exact energy that it had previously absorbed. So, it's fascinating to think about in what sense was the photon actually annihilated? In what sense was it a part of the electron? in that intervening time period. And then here when you have ionization, that's just when the outermost electron, there's the photon, the wavelengths of light, the energy packed in each individual photon is so high that it knocks the electron entirely out of orbit. And we already touched upon dark matter and the potential possibilities of what it might be in our Greatest Mysteries in Physics video recently, so I won't go into that too much, but uh, it's worth s commenting, remarking that uh, it's it makes up most of the universe's matter. It has some gravitational interaction with ordinary matter, but that's it. It doesn't interact in electromagnetically or in any other detectable way. So for as much as we know about ordinary matter, there's dark matter. At least as far as we know, it's only around corralling galaxies, being a nest, a cocoon inside which Nearly all galaxies exist. But if it's elsewhere, if it's surrounding us on a smaller scale, if it actually pervades inside the galaxy where we are, then we don't know. We have no way of detecting it. 
currently, at least. As a little excerpt on Niels Bohr here. It says, the Danish physicist Niels Bohr was the first to propose that electrons in an atom move within discrete orbits. He really kicked off the quantum era of quantum physics by using Planck and Einstein's ideas of photons only having discrete energies or at least interacting with electrons and atoms in when they had values of very specific discrete energies uh, he said that he suggests that these orbits have fixed energy levels the electron orbits that atoms emit or absorb energy in fixed amounts or quanta as electrons move between the orbits. These are now called orbitals, and they are the substructures of electron shells. Atoms are not all the same. They can hold different numbers of protons, neutrons, and electrons. A substance made of atoms of just one type is called a chemical element. The given atomic number is equal to the number of protons. The atoms of any element are all the same size and crucially contain the same configuration of electrons, which is unique to that element, and gives it its specific chemical properties. So it's the, I want to say the geometrical, the topography, topography of of the atom is, is made of the electrons surrounding it. And the electrons have a unique fingerprint. Each, each nucleus with a certain amount of protons, you know, carbon atom having six protons, helium having two, oxygen having eight, gold having, I don't know how many gold has, is it 79, something like that. Those Protons have a positive charge, and therefore they collectively have a collective positive charge, 6, 8, 79, respectively. And they are going to attract, that positive charge will attract a negative cloud of, a, of negatively charged electrons around it in a specific proportionate way. And so that proportionate attraction allows a elemental atomic fingerprint to uh, to exist and therefore each each atom even though it can have varying numbers of neutrons that won't change because their neutrons are neutral they have no negative or positive charge so that won't change the overall electrical charge of the nucleus and therefore the resultant electron negative electron cloud around it that's attracted to that particularly charged nucleus. And so, despite having very, very little chemical differences between isotopes or atoms with different numbers of neutrons, they, for the most part, are almost exactly the same. And that's why you can have something called heavy water, which is instead of H2O, where a hydrogen atom has one proton and then uh, naturally wants to have one electron surrounding it, you have deuterium. How do you spell that? Deuterium? 
which is called heavy hydrogen, one of two stable isotopes of hydrogen, um, the other being protium. So when hydrogen has, it has one proton, so when it has one, just uh, one proton and no neutron, it's called protium. A single positively charged proton and a single negatively charged electron. The nucleus of a deuterium atom is a single proton and one neutron. Whereas the far more common protium has no neutrons. So, um, deuterium has one proton, but because it has that extra neutron, that extra nucleon, it means it has two nucleons. We can see the table here of all the elements in their isotopes. So, these are the naturally, I, I believe blue means it's naturally occurring, and maybe red means it can, uh, it, it can exist, but isn't very natural. Um, <laughs> that's really cool right there. Filled with deuterium gas. So, about one atom in Earth's oceans, one atom of deuterium among every 6,500 atoms of hydrogen. So, hydrogen... typically occurs in pairs, just like oxygen. doesn't like to exist in isolation. But, uh... So yeah, you either call it protium when you're specifically talking about the individual hydrogen atom and how many nucleons it has. You have protium with no neutron, deuterium with one neutron in that proton. Um, So deuterium accounts for approximately 15 in a thousand naturally occurring hydrogen atoms in the oceans. Or about 1.5%. Uh, While protium accounts for more than 99.98%. And you can drink heavy water, which is instead of H2O, it's uh, D2O, instead of hydrogen, two hydrogen atoms, and uh, an oxygen atom, it's two deuterium atoms, so you have two extra neutrons there, and you can drink it, effect on biological systems, yeah. High concentrations of it, 90% heavy water, will kill fish and tadpoles and flatworms. But, uh, yeah, there's a, so you take a very large amount to replace 25 to 50% of the human body's water with heavy water. Accidental or intentional poisoning with heavy water is unlikely to point to the point of practical disregard. Poisoning would require the victim to ingest large amounts of heavy water without significant normal water intake for many days. Okay. Yeah. So because it doesn't really exist much in uh, in nature, it would have to be artificially produced and fed to you over many days and there's many more efficient ways of uh, causing someone's demise and procuring very expensive heavy water <laughs> so, um, 
Then we have chemical compounds. Most matter in the universe consists of unbound atoms of a few chemical elements, but a significant amount of uh, exists as compounds containing atoms of more than one element joined by chemical bonds. In ionic compounds, we got such as salts, atoms trade electrons, and the resulting charged ions are bonded by electrical forces arranged in rigid crystalline structures. And then in covalent compounds such as water, the atoms are held by structures called molecules by the sharing of electrons between them. Covalent. The outermost electrons are typically called the valence electrons or the valence shells. And when you have the sharing of two outer um, of electrons, so you have electrons of two atoms coming together, electrons in the outer shells are shared between the two outer shells of those, those atoms. It creates a covalent bond that we, we talked about being um, not very difficult to break. And once you do, if you have a, just like lighting a candle, if you have a, an initial energy like this, we have the energy created by the flame, this this system right here is its own system, but it's creating a flame. And you can light a candle and cause the covalent bonds in the wax to uh, oxidize with the oxygen in the atmosphere, creating a combustion. The bonds break, they release energy, and then when they drop back down, when those, the uh, excited electrons, excited to higher energy states by that release of energy of the surrounding reactions, when those electrons drop back down, this happens billions, billions of times a second. That's why we, uh, they, they produce photons when they drop back down, just like we see right here they emit photons so that's why we humans perceive a flame and I don't even know if they would have fast enough cameras to detect you know or at least precise enough high resolution enough cameras but uh, we detect it as a single fluid essentially the flame is a fluid it's not, you know, we're too, uh, it's too small and happening too fast for us to detect any discrete reactions. And certainly any discrete, uh, any discrete release of photons. We are way too macroscopic for that. Page two. <laughs> two hours later. So, ordinary matter exists in solid, liquid, gas, or plasma. So, ordinary matter exists in four states solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. These differ in energy. Of the matter is, uh, in the energy of the matter is particles, molecules, atoms, or ions. In the particles, freedom. So it's different energies with uh, solids, I guess, increasing in energies from solids 
to liquid to gas to plasma. If you think about a you know, simple melting ice cube, melting into a liquid, then eventually, even in room temperature, evaporating into a gas, and in the particles, freedom to move relative to one another. Substances can transfer between states by losing or gaining heat. The constituents of a solid are locked by strong bonds and can hardly move, whereas liquids, they are bound only by weak bonds. And in gas, the particles are bound very weakly and move with the most freedom. And then a gas becomes a plasma when it's so hot that collisions start to knock electrons out of its atoms. So a plasma is ions or nucleons, a nucleus, nuclei, with its valence electrons removed, knocked out from their orbital. So it's ions and electrons moving extremely energetically. And stars are made of plasma. So, being the most abundant, as far as we know, until we discover the true nature of dark matter, the abundant, the most common composition or constituent, uh, the common form of matter they are made of plasma, and so plasma is the most common state of ordinary matter in the universe that we know of. Gaseous being the second most common. Now forces inside matter here, the bonds that link the constituents, solids, liquids, gases, and plasma are based on the electromagnetic force. Gravity contains matter and binds it at the largest scales, but at the weakest, with the weakest binding energy. Electromagnetism binds matter or atoms together much more uh, with a much higher binding energy. But on much shorter scales, electromagnetism overpowers gravity very, very easily. This is what attracts particles of unlike charge. So, the other two forces that control matter on the small scales are the weak and the strong nuclear force. Strong force holds together the protons and neutrons and the atomic nuclei together. Strong force here, is, uh, like we talked about, is what holds the quarks together. And through another variant of the strong force, it holds the protons and neutrons themselves together. It's also known as the color force controls the quark's color property as it operates. The quarks constantly change color by exchanging virtual gluons. And the gluons are the force carrier particles between quarks. Here we have a red down quark, a green up quark, and a blue down quark. So between the red and the blue, in the green and the blue, we have a stronger bond. And then a smaller gluon force between the red and the green. It doesn't need as much of a force because, you know, red and green is already a very attractive pair. And that's why everybody loves Christmas, you know. And just look at, you know, intersections. They just go together. Um, the residual strong force. 
So yeah, the fundamental strong nuclear force is what holds quarks together to make protons. Then the residual strong nuclear force is what's holding individual nucleons or protons and neutrons together. So we have strong force being essentially what keeps nucle nuclei held together in such a compact local space. It's carried by, instead of gluons, the residual strong nuclear force is called, um, or generated, uh, carried by particles called pions. And pions are generated from energy created when nucleons try to move apart. This energy arises as a byproduct of one of the fundamental strong force of the uh, fundamental strong force. Once generated, pions are exchanged back and forth between the nucleons, creating a binding force. In electromagnetism, although it's uh, you know the most common to us, it's still just as mysterious. Because it's photon, it's light itself, electromagnetic waves that carries the force between like char or opposite charges attracting each other and like charges repelling each other. The EM force holds electrons within the shells surrounding the nucleus. It attracts negatively charged electrons toward the positively charged nucleus and keeps electrons apart. The force carrier for the EM force is light itself, the photon. Then you have the weak interaction. Kind of did those out of order, but uh, the weak interaction here is the force that governs radioactive decay among other interactions. Its force carriers are the W plus, W negative, and Z bosons. Here a W plus boson controls the changing of a neutrino into an electron and the transformation of a down quark into an up quark, converting a neutron into a proton. So a neutrino to an electron. W boson exchanged. You have a neutron composed of two down quarks and an up quark. The neutrino and neutron appear to interact here. W boson is exchanged is exchanged between the neutron and the neutrino. And instead of two down quarks and an up quark, now you have a the down quark, one of them, the red, was transformed into an up quark. Now you have two up quarks. So the neutron is now changed into a, a positive, positively charged proton. And then one of the byproducts is a neutrino transformed into a negatively charged electron. Steven Weinberg, he... I've never read it, but um, I think I should. He wrote a great book. He's a famous physicist and wrote a book about the Big Bang, the first three minutes, it's called. And he's a, an amazing physicist, best known for his theory of the two fundamental forces, the weak interaction and the electromagnetic force being unified. What won him the Nobel Prize in 1979 was saying that the electromagnetic and weak forces, the weak interaction, work in an identical way at extremely high energy levels, such as those existing at the Big Bang. Weinberg so-called 
his so-called electroweak theory confirmed um, was confirmed by particle accelerator experiments. So we weren't we're not able to perform experiments that allow energies high enough to detect or confirm that the electroweak force was and can be at high enough energies unified with the strong nuclear force. But we can detect, can recreate energies high enough to confirm that electromagnetism and the weak interaction are indeed the same force that congeals, cools out into two separate sides of the same coin, two different, uh, two different means of exchanging energies between matter at cool enough, cooler temperatures that uh, are more typical of today's universe. So he predicted that, um, which gave him and two others the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1979. So much of what happens in particle physics and quantum phys physics is trying to understand just what happened in the Big Bang when energies were high enough, when, you know, you had these forces interacting in a way that they suppose were identical to each other. So research is now centered on smashing particles together in particle accelerators, and these experiments have identified hundreds of mostly highly unstable particles, but different, unique particles, which differ in their masses, their electric charges, properties like spin, and uh, in the fundamental forces that they, that are characteristic of them. The standard model of particle physics is the current theory that tries to envelop them all under the same umbrella. And here's a diagram here that shows us how to classify them, how under the standard model of particle physics currently we have um, fundamental distinction here is that you have composite particles which have internal structure so a proton and a neutron those are not fundamental particles because they are made of quarks now quarks themselves are fundamental particles as far as we know they are not made up of anything smaller as far as we know um, and then there, another division is between fermions and bosons that we talked about in the Greatest Mysteries in Physics video, which uh, Dirac coined, naming after Enrico Fermi and uh, the Indian physicist named Bose, um, which I believe is the also, you know, he's a... His name was used in the Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, fermions, it, it might be the same guy. Might, there's another guy named Bose too, I believe. Um, oh no, I'm thinking of Bohm, David Bohm, different guy. So fermions. Leptons, quarks, and baryons are the building blocks of matter, and bosons, gauge bosons and mesons, are primarily force carrier particles. 
So leptons and quarks form matter. Leptons and quarks. Six different leptons exist, but the two above are the only two stable ones and those that occur in ordinary matter, whereas quarks, which have charges, electromagnetic charges, of two-thirds, the up has a charge of two-thirds, positive two-thirds, and the down has a charge of negative one-third, which is really interesting. The only fractional charge known in nature. There's six flavors of quarks, but only two occur in ordinary, ordinary matter, up and down, and each can exist in any of the three red, green, and blue colors. Gauge bosons. Now these are the force carrier particles, some shown or hypothetical here, but a photon, gluon, the W intermediate vector boson, um, and the Higgs boson, which is interesting. The uh, That's what was discovered at CERN through particle collisions. And it says here that it's theoretical or hypothetical, along with the graviton, which would theoretically be the force carrier of gravity, which I know has not yet been discovered, but uh, this book was written in 2005 and revised in 2012. And the Higgs boson... Follow the white rabbit back down the rabbit hole here is, uh, let's see. The Higgs boson, sometimes called the Higgs particle or the God particle, is an elementary standard model of particle physics produced by quantum excitation of the Higgs field. The standard model. Higgs particle is a massive scalar boson with zero spin, even positive parity, no electric charge, no color charge that couples to mass, also very unstable, decaying into other particles almost immediately upon generation. Um, after a 40 year search, a subatomic particle with the expected properties was discovered in 2012. So, it must have been to, uh, unless they just forgot to update this small little chart, and they did somewhere else in the book. It must have been before or after the editing, the final editing was done in 2012 of this book. It was discovered, uh, a subatomic particle with the expected properties of the Higgs boson it was discovered in 2012 by the Atlas and CMS experiments at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Geneva, Switzerland. Switzerland. The new particle was subsequently confirmed to match the expected properties of a Higgs boson. Physicists from two of the three teams were awarded the Nobel Prize in 2013. Although Higgs' name was associated with it, several researchers between 1960 and 72 independently developed parts of the theory that predicted it. And, uh... Okay. So it is, as of now, confirmed. No longer hypothetical. Then you have antiparticles. Most particles have an antimatter equivalent that has the same mass, but whose charge and other properties are opposite. So the same mass is a characteristic feature. They used to think um, of antiparticles, particles and ant matter and antimatter. They used to think that you had before, I forget what physicist in particular, but uh, 
generally in the late 1800s, early 1900s, before particle physics and quantum physics really started maturing, I guess, or was even developed, you had, it was known that a positive nucleus existed and you had a negative uh, outer shell after Rutherford did his famous gold foil experiments where he fired protons or was it electrons um, I think it was protons he fired positively charged protons proteums hydrogen atoms with no electrons so ionized hydrogen fired them individually at a very, very, very thin gold sheet. Now this thin gold sheet, and he had a detector, detectors centered uh, around which the gold foil was, uh, or in which the gold foil was centered, so that any particles flying off in the plane of the projection could be detected on the outside. They, they probably have a picture of it somewhere here. But um, when most of the time the positive proton was shot at the gold foil, it's the nucleus was so is so small and so dense, the positively charged nucleus that the proton most of the time is has a small probability, a really, really small probability of actually hitting the nucleus, and a high probability of interacting with the negative electron field around the nucleus. So, um, many times it would be slightly deviated this way and that way, but there was no dramatic impacts and then uh, he started noticing that um, it did every so often radically get deflected and sometimes almost directly back at the projector and so what that meant is that occasionally some very 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 small positive charge a repellent charge positive the same charge as the shot proton, the hydrogen nucleus, would deflect the positive um, proton projectile, and it deflected it almost back directly at it, and um, they thought that these, you know, the atom was made of essentially very symmetrical positive and negative charges. You had a positive charge at the core and a negative charge surrounding it, which was the electron, and they thought that if we could measure these, it would make perfect sense that their charges are equal. The electron does and is known to have an exactly equal and opposite charge as the proton, but it was not known whether their masses were equal. And it was thought it made perfect sense, especially in a in a um, an aesthetic, a religious way. You have equal and opposite forces in a very philosophic way. It makes sense that you would have equal and opposite charges have equal masses together. But it was found out, and it really confused them at first, when they discovered that the electron was way, way, way less massive than the proton. The proton was way heavier, and the electron was inexplicably, inexplicably uh, small, minute, and had almost no mass relative to the proton, the heavy proton, and then neutron later on. Um, and I've heard Eric Weinstein describe this as the issue where you have your, on one hand, you have three fingers that deceptively look like they're 
almost symmetric around the middle finger here. You know, your index and your ring finger. And then you're left with the dilemma of how to reconcile the very, your ring and your index, ring and index here, uh, looking so similar and symmetric. But you're left with the issue of how to reconcile this small pinky with this very unique thumb. Neither of which really gels with the uh, other three fingers. Until, which is a huge dilemma, you know, you might be trying to fit a square peg in a round hole there, until you recognize that the symmetry comes from an entirely mirrored hand, a mirrored appendage on the other side of your body, and you have perfect symmetry. No longer are these three kind of forced around some close but not quite perfect symmetry. But now, you have elegant symmetry, a perfect uh, mirror image. Everyone has its opposite, and that's the way they came up with, oh, that's not the way, that's a great analogy to visualize later experiments, further experiments, led to the discovery of not electrons and protons being matter and antimatter, perfect mirror opposites, because they weren't, but you had electrons and positrons being the uh, anti-electron with the exact charge of a proton, but the exact mass of an electron. And then you had antiprotons and antineutrons. These are the antiparticles made up of anti, um, and you had neutrinos and antineutrinos later, but, uh, so you have anti-quarks making up antiparticles, which is, uh, I mean, it's like pick one to be amazed at, but the fact that we have antimatter is extraordinarily exotic, yeah and foreign to try to imagine. And, you know, the thing that gives us energy and allows for the evolution of life, the reason we're really here, if you could really pick one, is the sun, stars, and the matter that, uh, the, the, processes of nuclear fusion, the fascinating interplay between the largest, the, the, the irreconcilable fundamental forces of gravity acting on the largest scales, compressing matter onto itself, and forcing a violent reaction coming out of the other three fundamental forces that are yet to be reconciled with gravity in nuclear fusion, creating these violent explosions of the atoms being forced on to overcome their binding energies and force together, releasing all that latent energy sitting within the, uh, the nuclear realm, domain. You have hydrogen, a single proton, fusing with another proton here, and one proton is converted into a neutron, and then you have a neutrino and a positron emitted, turning um, from the one proton turning into a neutron. Now you have deuterium. One proton, one neutron. You have a... Uh, then you have a, a proton and deuterium atom 
fusing together, emitting a gamma ray photon, gamma ray being the highest energy photon, the highest range of photon energies known, and causing a resultant product of a, uh, a helium, a helium-3 nucleus, which is helium always has two protons, but sometimes it can be helium-4. It depends on how many neutrons it has, like here. So you have a helium-3 with two protons and one neutron. Then those further combine with another helium-3 atom, and you have now the fusion of helium-3 nuclei forming a stable helium-4 atom and releasing protons to hydrogen nuclei. So you have this chain reaction happening in the core of all stars, and this is just one of the series or cycles of uh, nuclear fusion reactions happening, but um, you have larger and larger and larger nuclei fusing together in the cores of stars until the gravitational pressure becomes no longer sufficient to fuse anything heavier than typically about, uh, I think it's typically carbon, um, sometimes iron, all the way up to iron being, uh, having about, how many does iron have? 50 or so? Six protons. And fusion, the creation of new atoms from two atoms, two smaller atoms being fused together is called stellar nucleosynthesis. So, uh, according to current theories, the first nuclei were formed the first few minutes after the Big Bang through nuclear reactions and the process called Big Bang nucleosynthesis where essentially the entire universe was like the energy and pressure at the interiors, the cores of stars. And after about 20 minutes, it had finally expanded after inflation, after energy had had time to dissipate. It cooled to a point where these higher energy collisions among nucleons ended, and now you had the soup of ionized particles of positive nucleons, protons, sometimes neutrons together. Mostly hydrogen, some double proton pairs of helium, and very, very faint traces of lithium and then the electrons around them. But, uh, nucleosynthesis in stars and their explosions later produced a variety of elements. And then that makes up all the atoms that we are made up of, mostly carbon, much hydrogen, oxygen, and even heavier, heavier atoms like iron and nickel. Stars fuse, so anything heavier than hydrogen and helium is called metals by astrophysicists. So it's not the typical use of the word that most people use. Um, 
but that's how we got metals in the universe was after the Big Bang the hydrogen and some helium that was birthed and emerged out of the Big Bang we believe then later collapsed into stars clouds, nebulous clouds and then stars and perhaps some primordial black holes like we talked about in our other video and uh, up to including iron and nickel so iron is, has 26 protons nickel has 28 so you have iron, copper, and nickel and then all the other elements here we can see all these other elements from or is that cobalt and nickel? I guess from copper you know all the way through the highest elements some of which are uh, human synthesis there's no natural stable isotopes of way up here um, this table here gives us a great idea so exploding massive stars it produces all the other elements up to copper and nickel um, cobalt I think but also produces copper, zinc, gallium, germanium, um, is that arsenic? Selenium, bromine, krypton, and ru rubinium? Is that rubinium? Which one is that? 37. So, supernovae, exploding stars, or novae, um, produce more chemical elements, dying low mass stars, then produce the heaviest or heavier elements and the heaviest elements are produced from merging neutron stars which is amazing yeah some sort of the first hydrogen and helium it's amazing to think about what um, Steven Weinberg and others particle physicists and cosmologists think the universe was this quark gluon soup and gluons uh, or quarks tend to want to be in triplets and they snapped into place forming their bind together forming that massive that that natural tendency again pretty inexplicable to snap into triplets forming the first protons and neutrons and of course tons of antimatter existed too so you had anti uh, protons and anti neutrons as well and then the other inexplicable characteristic of our universe allowing our very existence is the slight very very slight overabundance of matter over antimatter. If we didn't have antimatter in a slightly less number and abundance, and um, if it didn't naturally happen and occur in the early universe in a slightly smaller amount, then we would no longer exist. Most matter and antimatter pairs annihilated in the universe, and it was just the remnant, the remaining marginal, fractional surplus of regular ordinary matter over antimatter that allowed and led to uh, the remaining helium and hydrogen that evolved into the stars that evolved into us. So you have neutrinos, gamma rays, and then just tons of high other high energy uh, photons and positrons being released from this system of reactions alone.
And then on the other end, you have fission. Unstable atomic nuclei can spontaneously disassemble, giving off particles and energy measured as radioactivity. And similarly, in the artificial process of nuclear fission, large nuclei are intentionally split into smaller pairs, and huge energy is released. That's what we developed in the 1940s. And on a cosmic scale, a more important phenomenon is nuclear fusion, though. And this allows the furnace of stars to be sustained over billions of years. energy, which is equal to that mass multiplied by the speed of light squared. And that energy is what warms up our Earth, is what we either directly or indirectly power everything sustenance we eat to the electricity we generate here on Earth, which is astounding how we're all connected that way. This is a neutrino observatory, the high energy processes in the universe produce neutrinos so they're fast particles that rarely interact with matter so to detect to in order for us to detect them scientists had to create what here is called the ice cube which is a neutrino observatory in in Ar arctica 86 holes drilled in the ice contain over 5,000 optical sensors. In the dark, clear ice, the sensors record faint flashes of light. And that represents the neutrinos interacting with ice molecules. So they're drilled all the way down so they have to pass through tens of feet thick of ice because they are so inert and so unlikely to interact with the ice they pass through dozens of feet before they do eventually So we have here the radiation, electromagnetic radiation. And then we have the, this showing us the different ways that we detect all the different energies of radiation from the cosmos from the longest radio waves to slightly shorter slightly more energetic microwaves then even more energetic infrared slightly more is visible light then beyond blue and violet in the visible spectrum is ultraviolet and then x-rays, and then gamma rays. Gamma rays are the most energetic.
x-rays, the orange-pink regions in this Chandra Observatory image of two colliding galaxies called the antennae. Page 317. The antennae galaxy here. A wide field view of the antennae taken from Earth reveals the bright distorted cores and the long faint streams. Streamers formed by the disrupted spiral arms of the interacting galaxies. I think the interaction of the antennae galaxies is about, it's an ongoing interaction that started about 700 million years ago. And then from here, the book goes on into gravity, motion, orbits, space and time, and relativity. Light's interaction in bending space-time. This is... Uh, One of the most visually interesting phenomena that we can observe from the heavens is bent, distorted, gravitationally lensed light from galaxies that are intercepted or distorted by intervening galaxies. Galaxies in between us and, and them. so incredible that Einstein's theory predicted this long before we were able to observe it. We never had any telescopes powerful enough to detect gravitationally lensed objects, let alone black holes. Yet Einstein's theory of general theory of relativity predicted that light, if you had the right configuration of galaxies, would be distorted just like light above a swirling pool of water gets wrapped around the center of the uh, vortex. It's amazing how light gets stretched like that. We have the idea of the Big Bang expanding in inflation and then through some unknown property, whether it's dark energy or some simple um, momentum of expansion, the universe has continued. To expand. And although we have evidence of radiometric dating from Earth and supernovae light curves from the most distant, uh, you know, six billion light years away, there is still exists the possibility that we are misinterpreting it and the universe could have been a little bit younger or even a little bit older than we think it could have been younger and it could have been expanding much quicker and then is now actually decelerating more quickly than we thought or it could have been much older 
and the universe is, has a much more gradual expansion. In both scenarios, both possible cosmic histories are, of course, have to match today's current observations. So particles at the beginning of the universe. This is really one of, if not the most, other than black holes, crucial areas of study to the extent that we can get any data beyond the cosmic microwave background, to the extent that any energy or signatures of gravity waves or uh, any other artifacts of the interaction of matter on massive scales of light years and millions and billions of light years, um, any of that information could have been transmitted across the age of the universe and the size of the universe too. This is the most crucial period for understanding exactly what is the what happens at energies that go from 3,000 degrees to trillions 1.8 1.8 billion trillion 10 18 billion trillion a thousand trillion trillion 1800 all the way to the inflation era where part of the universe expanded from billions of times smaller than a proton to something between the size of a marble and a football field at 1800 trillion trillion degrees 10 to the 27th power and if the temperature isn't fantastic enough to think about the time the sliver of time a hundred billionth of a yoctosecond we go from one microsecond a thousandth of a second through a billionth through a picosecond a thousand billionths to a femto an attosecond a zeptosecond a yoctosecond which is a Let's see, a billion, billion, then 18, then 24, a billion, six, a million, billion, billionths of a second, and then a hundred millionth of a octosecond, <laughs> and then a hundred billionth of a octosecond. When the universe was 1800 trillion trillionths of a degree, or degrees Fahrenheit. There is a super force. A super force that not only was the grand unified force of the strong, weak, and electromagnetic force at 10 to the 36th 6th seconds um, during the quark era, right before it. We had a split of the strong and the electroweak forces. And then at 10 to the negative 43rd seconds, a 10, <laughs> 10 trillionth of a octosecond, we had the grand unified force. And then, of course, some force theorized, hypothesized to exist that even combines the strong and electroweak forces with that grand unified force with gravity creating some some variation of a unified super force at the beginning of time 13.7 billion years ago it's really just amazing beyond all the little facts you could say 
that the overall concept that energy energy congealed into matter and matter itself is just frozen energy I think that might be the simplest way of conveying the absolute just fantastic fantastical nature of the Big Bang and how crazy how ridiculously exotic our everyday experience really really is at its core we're made up of atoms of electrons and these protons and neutrons that are made up of quarks that are 99% energy and what does that mean for our our experience that's what I want to know then we have these very um, well worked out theoretical mathematical with, with solid mathematical underpinnings these theories uh, one in particular like inflation which was hypothesized because what we now know the widely spaced regions of the universe could never have been so become so similar looking in density no matter where we look in our 360 degree sphere minus the plane of the Milky Way that we can't see beyond the universe looks uniform it looks dense equally dense everywhere it doesn't show any preferred direction it's isotropic and we think that inflation caused a very asymmetric universe to expand and become smoother and smoother and smoother we have a particle soup then over here after matter and antimatter had congealed out of the energy in the subatomic particles at a septosecond
supposed to make protons and neutrons. Other hadrons, such as mesons and antiperions, formed, but they quickly decayed or they were annihilated. So, for the next second, the residue of protons and neutrons could turn into each other, emitting and absorbing electrons and neutrinos as they did. So it wasn't until a millionth of a second after the Big Bang, which is forever on the scale of particle physics, that we had the first protons and electrons starting to form out of quarks around the beginning of the Hadron era quarks and antiquarks combined to form particles called the Hadrons these included baryons antibaryons and mesons a thousandth of a second then 999 millionths of a second later we have the lepton era. Electrons, neutrinos, and their antiparticles were very numerous, and the electrons annihilated with the positrons. Again, you had a surplus of the normal matter. Then the nucleosynthesis era, right at about one second after the Big Bang. Neutrons gradually converted into protons, but when there was about one neutron for every seven protons, most remaining neutrons combined with protons to make helium nuclei, each with two protons and two neutrons. Then you had the opaque era and the eventual balance of elements and the congealing, the capturing of electrons by the nucleons to form the first stable atoms, allowing the light that we now detect as the cosmic microwave background to travel into space. Here's the core look at the Large Hadron Collider. Scientists here in this particle accelerator, they're trying to simulate the incredibly hot, energetic, dense conditions of the Big Bang using a device called the LHC in a tunnel that is 17 miles long around Switzerland. Beams of particles are smashed together at high speeds and there's products. Everything that's been along the margins here. They're all studied. Shown here is one of the detectors called the compact muon solenoid. And these are made up of advanced electronics and massive, massive mag magnets, electromagnets. Out of the darkness, the aftermath of the Big Bang, and then life in the universe. Here we have a nice diagram of the Drake equation that breaks down the an intelligent hypothesis, a, a good way of maybe
quantifying the probability, the likelihood of other, well, of alien civilizations. It's a seven factor, seven variable multiplication you estimate the rate of starbirth, which here would be, and they think their example here says about 50 new stars in the per year in the Milky Way. Then you estimate out of those new stars how many have planets, perhaps 50% again. Then how many of those planets are habitable, and that's an ongoing area of study of exoplanets in which we look for signs of habitability or how fast are they orbiting are they locked tidally to their sun is there rotation that allows fairly frequent daily orbits around the planet's axis so that one side isn't um too hot, inhospitably hot, or the other side inhospitably cold for the evolution of life. How many planets do have life, which we think is fairly common? Intelligent life, uh, what would be the likelihood of a planet evolving life to have allowed for the evolution of intelligent life. Then, what's the likelihood that that intelligence reaches a point that they're able to communicate? And of course, we know once you develop sophisticated technology, that means you're developing sophisticated weapons. How long are those civilizations going to last? This particular example here is saying that there is a, in the entire Milky Way of billions of stars, 100 to 500 to maybe even a trillion stars, there's only 900 civilizations currently alive. So we have the fate of the universe, alien life, and the view from Earth, which uh, I'm going to go into next time. We're going to go ahead and end it here, guys. Thanks a million for watching, guys.